I don't want a lot for Christmas. There's just one thing I need, and that would be a kick-ass playlist of contemporary holiday pop songs that I can blast from Thanksgiving until New Year's Day, helping to ensure that this year, my friends and family have the hap-hap-happiest holidays since Bing Crosby tap dance with Danny fucking K. And that is just what we set out to give you, as the great pop culture debate is serving up 32 modern classics and our mission to name the best holiday pop song from 1980 to 2020. Looks like it's going to be a hard candy Christmas, so it's a good thing I love to suck. I'm your host, Eric Resniak. Please welcome my panel, the jolliest bunch of assholes this side of the nut house. Haul out the holly, it's Curtis Creekmore. We need a little Christmas now, Eric. Little Christmas is what I call my penis. I knew that because of the men's rooms in Boston. She received your dick in a box, and she exchanged it for scented candles. It's Heather McLean. Hi. <laughs> And last Christmas, she gave you her heart, but this Christmas, she's back handing out scorching cases of herpes. It's Kate Kate Reculia. And there is no gift receipt for that. But there is a Valtrex prescription. Before we dive into the debate, let's go over how this works. We made a list of more than 100 notable holiday pop songs released from 1980 to 2020. Please note that date range, because if you're looking for chestnuts like, well, chestnuts roasting over an open fire or other classics, we'll be handling those in a separate debate, hopefully next year, should society survive the next few months. (laughs) The list included pop songs released in America related to any of the holidays between Thanksgiving and New Year's Day. So yes, Hanukkah songs were included in the poll. They just didn't get many votes. We had just shy of 100 people take the survey to pick their favorites, and the top 32 vote getters were ranked by popularity, added to a bracket, and our panelists made their decisions. Now we argue about it and insult each other all for your amusement. Want to follow along at home? You can find all of the brackets, including the one for this episode, at greatpopculturedebate.com. Make a copy for yourself, fill it out, and then compare it to our panelists' picks. Think we're way off base? Drop a comment on this episode on the website or yell at us on social media. And if you want to listen to the songs that make the bracket, you can find a playlist of the top 32 as well as some other popular picks from the poll in the bonus content section of our website. And Christmas has come early, ladies and gentlemen, because we also made a second playlist made up of suggestions from our listeners, which you can also find at our website. Before we get into the debates, let's go over the unanimous victors in round one. Mariah Carey's holiday juggernaut and ultimate number one seed, All I Want for Christmas is You, silenced eight seed Christmas is the Time to Say I Love You by Billy Squire. Baby It's Cold Outside by John Legend and Kelly Clarkson, a four seed, froze out Winter Wonderland by Tony Bennett and Lady Gaga, a five seed. Hard Candy Christmas by Dolly Parton, a three seed, will indeed be fine and dandy after kicking Run DMC's Christmas and Hollis straight to the curb. Last Christmas by Wham, also a one seed, wrapped it up and sent it, uh, that being an eviction notice, to Maroon 5 and its eight seed version of Happy Christmas, War is Over. Whitney Houston's Do You Hear What I Hear, another one seed, was deaf to Sam Smith's mewling in his eight seed Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas. <laughs> and finally, Carol of the Bells by Pentatonix, a three seed, hit all the right notes against John Mellencamp's I Saw Mommy Kissing Santa Claus, a six seed. And now we're on to the debates. Three quarters of us were dreaming of White Christmas by Sharon Jones and the Dap Kings, a seven seed, while Heather boldly sought to answer Faith Hill's treacly Where Are You Christmas, a surprisingly high two seed, and I hear her groaning already. I will bring the funk in honor of the late great Sharon Jones while Heather embraces Faith's seasonal schmaltz. Heather? You know... This song really comes down to one thing for me, and that's the visual. One of my all-time favorite movies as a kid was the remake of uh, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. And as you may recall, this song features in that movie, and all I can see is little Cindy Lou Who and Jim Carrey in his excellent role as the Grinch. And it just, it makes me think of the holiday season and warms my heart in a way that unfortunately Sharon Jones and the Dap Kings don't. And I get that. Uh, And we all, with every debate, we all bring something different to what we're looking for. And I think with the holidays, we discussed this in the other holiday podcast we did this season, 
the holidays are so about nostalgia. Like our choices are really defined a lot. I think if you look at it by things that really hit us when we were kids and we kind of absorb them and it becomes our thing. Right. So for you, this song and that movie are like quintessential cornerstones of Heather's holiday experience. Yeah. Correct? And it's not to say that I don't think White Christmas is a quintessential holiday song. In fact, I kind of wish these two weren't pitted against each other mm. because there were way other song pairings where I was like, yeah, I kind of hate both of these. <laughs> Whereas Good. This, I'm like, oh, both of these I love. And I really, I, I was torn. I was mm. torn on this one. But I have to go with, you know, nostalgia and as a kid on Christmas morning. And, you know, I think my poor parents watched this movie 12 times each holiday <laughs> season with my sisters and me. Like, you know, it's the movie where when we used to take car rides with a VHS player between Ooh. the seats to Canada from North Carolina, this was the one where we were like, we'll watch it again. We'll watch it again. <laughs> and just to clarify, your parents are now divorced, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Divorced. I'm not saying there's a link. <laughs> right? There's any link between family road trips to Canada with five people in one car, but draw your own conclusions. And a Grinch. Um, I, I will say, I know there are some people who actually actively dislike this song, Curtis. Um, I don't, <laughs> you, you you told me you don't like that, this, uh, this Where Are You Christmas song. You, you finish up. I'll talk in a second. Okay. <laughs> um, I actually don't mind it. I think it is so, like, it is lacks any subtlety whatsoever that it almost verges on camp to me, which yeah. is why I kind of love it. Like it is so earnest and unabashedly so that I find it weirdly charming and say what you want, but Faith Hill sings the hell out of that song, but I'm going to talk about white Christmas and I'm going to tell you why I think it needs to advance here. Uh, first, this is a funky reinterpretation of a creaky old standard. And if you don't start launching into some deep shoulder action by bar three, you are dead. Like you have no soul. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I am extremely white. I'm like practically a marshmallow, but even I get some moves when I'm listening to this song. It is a like critical party banger. If you're having a holiday party, if you are having a holiday party in 2020, please observe strict social distancing. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Yeah, um, have a yeah. party just with the members of your own household or your cats. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, I think cats. We can lift social distancing rules when it comes to that. Yes. Um, Sharon unfortunately died in 2016 from cancer, and that is such a loss. Um, the band was really just starting to kind of take off. She had so much more to share with us, and anyone who loves holiday music and funk and soul, or just having a good time, owes it to themselves to go buy, don't stream, buy a copy of Holiday Soul Party. This album album because it is magnificent and um sharon deserves this type of support so for me I i'm not even gonna knock where are you christmas but um this is such a different song from virtually anything else on this list and i have loved it since the minute i heard it 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 sends me. Curtis, were you going to say something? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, my world is changing. <laughs> this song, changing. Y'all listen to it. Go listen to it. Changing. She's a country singer. We should hear our vowels. No, I love. Oh, I'm from Kentucky. We haven't been on a podcast <laughs> together yet, Heather. No, I we have not. <laughs> love Faith Hill. I was mm. obsessed with the women of 90s country. That mm. is my favorite genre. You, if you could like narrow down and drill down, women of 90s country is me. But I cannot in good conscience move this song forward mm -hmm. over Sharon Jones, who before doing my homework, I had never heard of. Like mm. the reason that I listened to this song, when I did the bracket, I immediately put Faith Hill forward because I was like, oh, I know that. I like that song. It's okay. Then I listened to them both back to back. Faith Hill, it's almost like she was singing for Armageddon, like the Aerosmith <laughs> yeah. song. It has yeah. that level of like, this is so important. And it's like, no, honey, you're singing about Christmas. Sharon Jones, it's such a fun take on a classic. I love at the top of the second verse when the backup singers come in and it's like, yes. the, I'm dreaming of a white mm -hmm. Christmas. It's you, you cannot stop moving no. mm -hmm. the whole time it is it is amazing that is some good shit and i'm i am sad that it's up against faith hill because i think what like where are you christmas could go forward but i'm going with white christmas you know this is not the hill i die on so i am willing <laughs> the, faith the faith hill, hill you die on <laughs> the faith hill that i die on but a ching 
Exactly. <laughs> Kate, where are you? Oh, White Christmas, by far, by far. Okay. I love a kitschy holiday song as much as the next person, but White Christmas is really special. All right. So with that, we're going to advance White Christmas. Where are you, Christmas? Not on this bracket. All right. We're going to move on. <laughs> Heather was again the lone holdout, leaving a love note for four seed Santa Baby and my Madonna, while the rest of us were making our lists and checking them twice for Santa Claus is coming to town by the Pointer Sisters, a five seed. Heather, let's see if Santa believes in you, <laughs> while Kate wants a bicycle and to advance the Pointer Sisters. <laughs> So I got a really sad story to tell you. Oh, oh good. I love involve, human pain. Does it involve like shoes, like two baby shoes? New well, shoes? Isn't, that a, isn't, that a, isn't that a song that didn't make Christmas crack? shoes? The Christmas yeah, shoes. Thank God it's not here. Is. Yeah, we the Christmas that. shoes to go with the Pointer Sisters. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Um, no, the sad story is that in this case, I, I think I had um, click fatigue. <laughs> and definitely would never choose Madonna over the Pointer Sisters. So we're going to go with too much eggnog, human error. That's fine. Pebcake. And I'm I was... really sorry about that. But <laughs> like, Pointer Sisters, come on. <laughs> That is quite all right. And so, Kate, I'm going to have you save your Pointer Sisters argument you got for it. round two. You got but it. But I am then going to sink, sneak in here and ma- speak on Madonna. Sorry, I'm talking so much in this episode, everybody. <laughs> um, I actually love Santa Baby and My Madonna. It's one of those songs that people are like, oh, God, that version of Santa Baby is the worst. Every generation has their own definitive version of Santa Baby, right? We all accept this. And I think most people who have taste are going to tell you <laughs> that the definitive Santa Baby is the Eartha Kit version. Yes. Mm-hmm. I'm that not is, here yeah, to tell correct. you you're wrong. That <laughs> is the correct answer. But I don't think that the existence of Madonna Santa Baby takes away from the Eartha Kit Santa Baby. I think it stands on its own. She's doing a character. It's like a mob mall or like a chorus girl. It's very take back your mink from guys and dolls. <laughs> and I think she executes it really well. Madonna gets a lot of shit that she doesn't deserve. We did an entire podcast about this in season zero, which you can access by being a Patreon subscriber. Ding! Um <laughs> um, but I actually think this version is totally solid. It's not Eartha Kit, but what is? Um, so the only reason I did not vote for it is because it's up against the fucking Pointer Sisters. Right. Santa Claus is coming to town. <laughs> that's the only reason. And Heather. How- <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, I'm going to go stand against the wall, okay? <laughs> we already put you there when we were recording. You're missing that, folks. You put we baby already, in the corner, you know? We put, baby in the, we put Santa baby in the corner. Oh, yeah. Um, God, the puns tonight, they're just free-flowing. But um, we are going to advance the Pointer Sisters, and we will talk more about them in round two. Another majority decision in favor of Christmas wrapping by the Waitresses, a three-seed, over We Need a Little Christmas by the cast of Glee, a six-seed. I will generously tip my waitresses while Curtis will teach us well to live each living day. Curtis, why don't you go first? I'm... I'm really sad that I'm alone on this one because this song is fantastic. Um, I learned in my research when I was, because we do research on this in case you didn't know, Mm -hmm. um, this song was originally performed by one Dame Angela Lansbury in the 1966 (laughs) Broadway musical MAME. So Mm -hmm. first of all, how very dare you all vote against that? Because uh, that's but, that's a different time bracket than this yeah, one. <laughs> this is fair not point. the Lansbury version. It's the Glee version. <laughs> so fair. However, to me, that's even more impressive. You have a song from a television show that was so memorable and iconic that it made a best holiday pop bracket. This isn't a best TV show musical number bracket. It is all holiday pop post-1980. And this wasn't even bottom of the bracket. It was a six seed. So for people to be able to say that this thing from a television show was a memorable enough holiday song to include in the top 32 songs for the last 40 years, that says something to me. The performance itself is amazing. It's so good. It showcases the vocals of Amber Riley who somehow still has not received the record deal and or Broadway role that she absolutely deserves. Preach. She was turned away from American Idol, if you didn't know that, which I'm honestly thankful for because then we would not have had her on Glee. Mm -hmm. In any case, it's a fun, family-friendly song. We don't have a ton of those on this podcast. Mm -hmm. With a classic feel that was performed by a bunch of really talented folks on a television show. And that 
was memorable enough to make this bracket. You do not have to sell me on how good this song is. And in fact, the whole Glee Holiday CDs are really good. Mm -hmm. uh, one of our friends, we were having a meeting last night, and he's like, ugh, I wouldn't want to talk about the Glee Holiday songs. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. The Glee Holiday albums are really solid. And I, again, it's one of those things that gets a lot of criticism that I don't think it deserves. This particular one is one of my all-time favorites. It does take that old show and bring it back and make it modern and accessible for your generation. I, I will not say anything negative about this song at all. And We Need a Little Christmas, super catchy song just in a, on its face. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm sorry I'm talking so much this episode. <laughs> we were supposed to have Heather in between the last two ones. So I swear everything's even. I promise. I, I plan it that way. But I am going to talk about The Waitresses. So um, this particular song I actively remember listening to as a kid on the radio in the 80s getting ready for Christmas. And it always excited me. I had no idea it was even called Christmas wrapping, <laughs> which is a pun in the title it's of a so holiday good. song. It's so what? Good. Until probably the late nineties. I always thought it was called Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> um, I wonder why. I wonder, I wonder why. why. Really? <laughs> really? I didn't know. Like, but that, in the eighties, they didn't know, you didn't know the songs, right? I didn't know the titles. Um, but it opens really gently with this piano and bell thing. And then it launches into that sick, bass line and the drums and that lets you know this is a very different kind of christmas song from virtually anything else that i can think of at least from that time it was a genuine pop rock christmas song and i loved it and it has been repeatedly covered by newer pop stars but in my opinion nobody's ever come close to what the waitresses deliver here nope. Nope, um nope, it's nope. that it's that kind of simultaneous speak song voice that the waitresses have and it's so effective and this song it's like a perpetual motion machine it just keeps going and building the drum beat everything about it is perfection and <laughs> if anything else i know what boys like and boys like christmas wrapping by the waitresses <laughs> so oh boy um, Eric, can... you, yes you don't think that the spice girls did a good rendition of this i mean no. i'm just you know? I'm not saying it's not good. No, nope. I'm saying it doesn't live up to the original. I'm, I'm, I'm saying, saying it's not good, and I like <laughs> the Spice Girls. <laughs> we love the Spice Girls. We, I will not say anything bad about the Spice Girls, literally ever. But in Kate my will. opinion, <laughs> will you, Kate? What? You will be smirched the good name of the Spice Girls. No, I will just say that their cover of this song is not worth listening to. <laughs> Boom. So, Kate, wow. where are you coming down on this particular oh, vote? Oh, Christmas wrapping. I don't want to, like, show my hand or anything, but of all of the songs on this list, literally, this is the only unique to the 1980s Christmas song that I listen to voluntarily, repetitively. So, there we go. <laughs> I'm with Heather, you. Where, Heather, oh, you're I'm on this one, too? I'm 100% with you. Uh, like, if you were to look through my Christmas oh, playlist, yeah. it's like 90s, 90s, early 2000s, 90s, 90s Christmas wrapping. Yes. yes. <laughs> yep. And and I think there's something to be said, too. If we're doing, if we're if next year, you know, fingers crossed, <laughs> we do the previous one, like, I, I'm always going to give the edge to the song that is native to the time period that we're talking about. Not sure. Not the performance. The song. <laughs> the song. I see yes. what you're saying. Yep. Eric. Saying. Sir. May I go down in flames? <laughs> uh, I feel like you do everything in flames, oh, but go thank ahead. You, thank you. So I know I'm outvoted here, but I must, I must say, Christmas Wrapping is possibly one of my least favorite songs no. on this bracket. It is the worst of everything 80s wow. to me. Wow. That's, like, that's almost a harsh falls. statement. Were you, yeah, how, well, how aware were you doing during the 80s? So um, I was born in 86. Yeah, so it's yeah, fair. I, like I was four <laughs> at the most throughout that time. But just now, like looking back on it, I, I'm not a big fan of anything 80s, but it has that talk singing thing that I, it makes my skin crawl. I hate mm. talk singing. Mm. And <laughs> the earworm saxophone section <laughs> that is all you hear for the entire <laughs> week <laughs> after you listen to the song once. You say that like I, it's a bad thing. thing. I <laughs> hate it. I, I hate mean, it. I hate saxophone, it. Isn't it always I, a bad thing? No, in my what? opinion, what's wrong with the world right now is we don't have enough scorching sax Excuse souls. me, excuse me, like, did, did I get anti-saxophone sentiment just expressed? Oh, what? Kate <laughs> 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 is about to throw down. I did not say that necessarily. I'm just saying I don't like this song. I'm and you know what? It's moving sleeves, forward. Sleeves, you can't Kate, see it. Kate, I don't think we can be friends anymore after this. After what I have seen you do in this bracket, I don't think we can be friends anymore. <laughs> oh my God, that so, hurts my soul. Curtis... <laughs> 
I'm going to tell you, and in fact, I'm going to tell our listeners something very important. I'm going to give you a heads up. When we do our line of great pop culture debate t-shirts, one of the first ones will be, you are entitled to your wrong opinion. (laughs) And I am going to send you a complimentary t-shirt, Curtis, (laughs) signed from the waitresses, because you are entitled to your wrong opinion. With that, we are moving Christmas wrapping on to round two. We are currently tied between Britney Spears' My Only Wish Parentheses this year, like uh, <laughs> a seven seed, a whisper, voice. A whisper voice. All parentheses have to have whisper voice. And Adam Sandler's Hanukkah song, a two seed. Curtis, why is it Britney, bitch? And Kate, <laughs> why are you jumping for Goy with the Hanukkah song? Kate, go first. Oh yay! So the Hanukkah song. This song is. I, it's the only explicitly Hanukkah song on the bracket. Yes. 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 Um, it is a song that was came out and became famous and popular during the time period we're looking at. It is a very funny, cheeky, um, affectionate song <laughs> that is written from the point of view Adam Sandler says on the album. You know, I'm just writing. I'm, uh, this song is for all those nice little Jewish kids who like don't have any any popular songs. Like when when all the Christian kids in their school are celebrating Christmas, so it is already this sort of proud, cheeky, funny song about celebrating Hanukkah. It's informational. This is how I know that the late Dinah Shora and Bowser from Shanana were Jewish. Mm. I wouldn't know that yeah. otherwise. Um, and yeah. it's <laughs> excuse me. I am not Jewish. I certainly cannot speak uh, to someone of the Jewish faith if the irreverence of this of this song is offensive. But I think that it is a true pop culture phenomenon song that like went across all different forms of media. People know the Hanukkah song. And my last point is that Neil Diamond covered it on his very cherry Christmas album. And there's <laughs> very little <laughs> that you can do <laughs> to top that. <laughs> That is a compelling argument. Curtis, I'm going to throw you Britney, please. Now, I am not here to convince you that Britney Spears is a talented musician. Thankfully, because I do not think that that is possible. But I am here to say that my only wish, parentheses this year, deserves (laughs) to move forward. I appreciate that it wasn't a rehashing of some classic song like we've seen with some of the other things here. And that is one of the things that I definitely took into consideration in my deliberations. Original songs got a few bonus points. I mean, Hanukkah song is also technically original, but still terrible. I do not like Adam Sandler. I never have. I don't know that I ever will, but I definitely never have. And I think it might be because in the eighth grade, my absolutely useless social studies teacher did not teach a single lesson all year. Instead, he made us watch Billy Madison and Mm -hmm. Happy Gilmore Mm -hmm. on repeat. Mm -hmm. Literally. We had to watch them back to back over and over. Fuck you, Mr. Pennington. (laughs) Anyway, beyond that, While I appreciate that we have at least one song representing Hanukkah and the Jewish faith, I am sincerely sorry to the entire Jewish community that it is this one. I would rather listen to Harvey Firestein read the phone book, which is honestly not far from what this is. (laughs) I love that our listeners included songs like this one and spoilers, dick in a box, it's coming because they are representative of the holidays, but This simply is not a good song, whereas I think Dick in a Box actually has some musicality to it. Mm -mm. This song is like that one guy who brings a guitar to every college party and plays Wonderwall. Like, (laughs) you wish he would stop, but you feel kind of sorry for him, so you just let him finish before drowning him out with your stereo. And what's on the stereo? Britney fucking Spears. (laughs) <laughs> okay, those are good arguments. Thank you very much. Um, I will say that Joel Bodecker, who is of the Jewish faith and a, pod, uh, a member of our podcast family, literally said to me, um, you please don't feel obligated to include the Hanukkah song on behalf <laughs> of, of the chosen people because we hate that song. I was like, okay, cool. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Heather, where are you coming down on this? You know, I am with Kate and I, I, I agree with Curtis that th- this is not a example of fine musicianship no, no that <laughs> is, is, it's a fair point and i'll concede it is brilliant imagery like the line paul newman's half jewish goldie hans half two put them together what a fine looking jew hmm. now in my mind i'm like 
what happens if you put Goldie Hawn's face on top of Paul Newman's, right? Like, <laughs> this song makes my brain do things that it wouldn't do without prompting. And I appreciate any kind of music that can do that for me. <laughs> and this song, it's catchy and it's kitschy. And here's the thing. I love Britney. I think we should free Britney. But <laughs> I don't. She's trying. She's trying. I don't think that's her best song. Like my only wish this year. <laughs> <laughs> I um to beat the Hanukkah song, you have to do better. Mm. Okay, okay. Um, I will say that I'm going to stick with my vote for Britney. So we're tied. And the way that tiebreakers work for the main episodes is we have to go by seeds. Um, I had forgotten that in the previous episode until my brother reminded me. <laughs> Whoops. Um, so the higher seed here is actually Hanukkah song. So Hanukkah song will advance to round two. Uh, congratulations, Jewish people. You did it. Uh, um, but I'm, I'm sticking with Britney because I think it's a catchier song. And I agree with everything that Curtis said. I, I, I just can't with Adam Sandler. Uh, we were evenly split between Underneath the Tree by Kelly Clarkson, a five seed, and Christmas Baby Please Come Home by U2, a four seed. I will explain why I am wrapped up in Clarkson's Red, while Heather will explain why we too should vote for U2. Uh, and Heather, why don't you go first? You know, for me, it just goes back to when I looked at this list broadly, there, there's nothing like U2 on here. And I like, you know, kind of a... I'm going to go out on a limb and call them a pop rock band that kind of like brings it to Christmas. And I don't know how to explain it any better than that. Unfortunately, this is not one I would have loved to argue for you. <laughs> I, in fact, the honest answer is I really just hate this Kelly Clark. Oh, really? Oh. Heather, Heather, you have a friend in me. You have a friend in me. <laughs> As I did this, I was like, the gays are going to smite me on this. <laughs> they will. So You're, you are about to get split ends. Your your tights are not going to fit oh. properly. You've been cursed. Are you taking the heel off of my shoe too? Like, come on. I don't have to take it off. It's going to take itself off. That's, oh. that, that's what's going to happen. Oh. Um, okay. So I, I can hear Curtis burning through the microphone. <laughs> Ladies, um, I am boiling. <laughs> Ladies, my blood is boiling. Um, um, I will say this. Um, I love this Kelly Clarkson song first. And frankly, the entire Wrapped in Red album arguably could be on this goddamn mm -hmm. bracket. It has so many great songs. To me, it is second only to Mariah in terms of modern pop original Christmas albums yep. of the past 20, 30 years. Um, if I had to trace it, like full albums I'm talking about. I think it is really, really good. And Underneath the Tree is a great song just in of itself. I think that chorus is undeniable. It soars, it builds, it has this great little bell accompaniment. Like to me, it's an excellent, excellent song. Here's what I'm going to say about you two. I'm going to pull the Michael Barber Memorial. <laughs> I'm going to argue for my song <laughs> by taking out the other competitor. <laughs> um, I hear what you're saying about the fact that it's a pop rock and I would just say flat out rock band. Yeah. Do see, I hesitate to do that. That's my problem, but okay, fine, fine. I'll concede rock band. <laughs> but this song and many songs on this bracket, in fact, come from the very special music album that was put out as a fundraiser mm -hmm. in the 1980s. I think so it was true. to benefit AIDS. It was to um, benefit causes. Special Olympics. I looked it up. Yes. Yep. Oh, since special Olympics. since yep. it, the first album came out in 1987, and I just want to drop some knowledge on you. The very first three songs on that very first album are Santa Claus is Coming to Town by the Pointer Sisters, Winter Wonderland by the Arrhythmics, Do You Hear What I Hear by Whitney Houston. So this album... Is, is magic is magic this, and represented quite well in this bracket but yeah quite well i literally think almost every song from the album is on the top 32 yep. of this bracket yep. and mm. deservedly so because it is great and by the way there are subsequent volumes of that of that project that have really good songs as well yes. i think in fact the tom petty song on here is from yep. the second it's the volume. first yep. song on the second album yep Correct. So, um, and please bring those back because what I'm trying to get to here with Heather, with you is it is a rock band doing a Christmas song, but it was part of an overarching project in which many rock bands were doing yeah. Christmas songs. And of all of the very special Christmas songs on this bracket, this is one of my less favorite ones. It's still a great song and I listen to it every year and I, I sing along like Bono's intro to that is very butch and I like I can't even attempt it because like, <laughs> it's like four octaves lower than I can go. But um, to me, it is a 
makeup, or excuse me, a makeup, a remake of an existing holiday song that they're putting their unique spin on, and it's a very good spin. This is Kelly Clarkson doing an original song, and I'm always going to give that precedence over a remake, a cover. So with that said, it sounds like, Kate, you are distinctly pro U2. Oh, God. It's not even that I'm pro U2, and I really, I love Kelly Clarkson as a singer. I do, too. This song sounds like a Macy's commercial, and I cannot do yes. it. <laughs> There were so many other songs from Wrapped in Red that we could have picked that probably might have even swayed me. Interesting. All right. Curtis, I know you and I know you're a team <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So that brings us to another tie. And in terms of seeding, you 2 actually wins. <gasps> no, ma'am. It's a four seed <gasps> and Kelly Clarkson is a five seed. This is exactly, by the way, what happened in the breakup songs <laughs> episode. <laughs> you if you haven't listened. Yep. It's exactly what happened where you 2 kept squeaking through to the next round. I'm like, how the fuck did we get there? That was a genuinely like really good U2 so- song, though. This one is sort of a like, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> I actively dislike you two. I know I'm saying that a lot tonight. I have very strong opinions, but you do, Curtis. I am. I am shocked. I am shocked that Kelly Clarkson was such a low seed here. Oh. That is, I thought it was she was like a two seed in this, but mm, it's a bad oh. seed for her. Sadly, not. Bad I am. I agree. I am, yep. I might go set myself on fire. <laughs> well, with that, we are going to take a quick break so we can refresh our eggnog and Curtis can set himself on fire. Thank you. But we will be right back for the rest of round one. We'll be right back. This year, as you pour over your holiday shopping lists, consider giving the gift of pointless pop culture arguments and flagrant dick jokes by buying a great pop culture debate Patreon subscription for a loved one, or even someone you don't really care about. Whatever works, really. Could you buy three meals a day with just 70 cents? In this economy? Of course not, you ignorant slut. But for just 70 cents a day, you could support the horrible puns and terrible vices of notable homosexuals like little Eric here. I'm not that little. With your Patreon subscription, you help to keep our depraved podcast going. And you also get early access to all our episodes, exclusive Patreon-only content, and some great pop culture debate swag that you will probably lose in your desk. Is that desperate enough for you? Do you need to hear a Sarah McLaughlin song to show you how pathetic we are? We couldn't afford it. Please just give us your money. Go to patreon.com backslash great pop culture debate today. And we are back with the rest of round one of the best holiday pop song in 1980 to 2020. While we were gone, we were visited by three ghosts and have learned a valuable lesson. We promise 50% fewer dick jokes for the rest of this episode, unless those dicks are in boxes. <laughs> in what I'm sure will be a highly controversial debate, half of us believed in the Pogues' fairy tale of New York, a six seed, over Band-Aid's 1984 anthem, oh, Do They Know It's Christmas, here we go. a three seed. <laughs> Curtis is going to throw his arms around the world by standing Band-Aid while I will deliver the counterpoint, which is, spoiler, white nonsense. Curtis, go for it. (laughs) Y'all strap in because this is where it takes off. This for me was a literal race to the bottom. (laughs) I'm right here, Curtis. I don't know what you're ranking. (laughs) Is that a race you find yourself in often? (laughs) Eric, yes, absolutely. Yes, I do win. I, I typically win most things. Do They Know It's Christmas is tone deaf. It is borderline offensive. It's a lot of things. And (laughs) Okay. It is horrifically tone deaf and offensive, and it should be wiped from the annals of music, I would say. However, I still chose it over the Pogues. I'm with you, Curtis. I have had diarrhea that was more musical than that song. (laughs) I am actually offended that I had to listen to it as a part of this podcast, and my emotional distress lawsuit is pending. (laughs) The courts are backed up with, you know, election fraud lawsuits from the Trump campaign, but it'll get through. In all honesty, I so once I actually listen to it and once it picks up, it's not atrocious. It's 
I appreciate an Irish jig. Like it's fine, but their accents are so strong that I can't actually understand what they're saying most of the time. I'm pretty sure I heard something about a slut in a jumper, which makes sense as to why you chose this. Yep. It is. This song was written for you. And if that doesn't say Christmas, (laughs) I don't know what it is. Um, Do they know it's Christmas at the time was a mega star event. You got Bono, Phil Collins, Banana Rama, Spandau Ballet, Duran Duran, Sting, Cool in the Gang, Jody Watley, Boy George, and George Michael, all in the same place, plus other people who weren't as important because I didn't write them down, <laughs> all to sing a song about Ethiopian famine. That's that's an amazing feat. And apparently the song's writers hoped that it would raise 70,000 pounds for Ethiopia as like a fundraiser. And within 12 months of it being released, the song actually raised 8 million pounds. Do They Know It's Christmas also led to We Are the World being made, which also led to Live Aid and Comic Relief. So while the song has its problems, it was a monumental music event, not just for holiday music. So that's why I Is that it. your argument? Okay. <laughs> was it not good enough? No, it was a very good argument. I had no idea that it predated We Are the World. Yeah, I it was the first that. one. It was good the research. first charity single. Good research. Yeah. Um, so Curtis actually took a lot of my arguments here. And here's <laughs> where I'm gonna say this. Um I actually don't care for Fairy Tale of New York. I know it is very popular. It's a very popular song with a certain group of people who I think Frankly, Kate, and this is going to offend you probably, <laughs> who want to think that they're cooler than they are. I'm just going to say it. Just going to say it. Did you enjoy that slap across the face? Um, I felt it. Did you hear I, that? <laughs> thank you. Um, I do agree with Curtis that once the like Irish jig comes in and Christy McCall, who complete sidebar if you've never listened to her in these shoes it's a great feminist anthem um but when she comes in and they do the banter it's a it's actually a really charming song and i love that part but fucking a that intro <laughs> with that guy who sounds like he's chewing gravel it's i'm like who? Babe. i won't i won't chewing gravel won't do it while intoxicated yeah. i'm like <laughs> who are you day. trying to impress like it's it's I, it's trying so hard to be alternative and cool and i get it but like this is a fucking holiday music bracket not like i'm showing you my cool badge and so from that perspective i don't care for it and i'm super excited for it to get shot down in round two but for round one i do need to push it forward because band-aid i, I agree with almost everything Curtis said in terms of it's as a song let's just strip away it from its background as a song fucking catchy loved it as a kid um it's stupid it like doesn't lyrically it's it's terrible but it's so good to sing along to and you do have that incredible cast of people singing it but I do want to point out the fact that you have banana you have banana rama you have banana Rama and Jody Watley, and you can't pick out a single female voice in that entire mix. Not one. No. There's literally nothing but white dudes singing any yeah. of the solos in that song. And it's a song that's supposed to be raising money for Africa. I'm going to get on a little bit of a soapbox here. Oh, do it, do it, do it. Get up there. Curtis and I have worked with people, I'm not naming names, Ooh. who are from that era that were young adults in the 1980s and early 90s who believe that the way to address social ills is to merely acknowledge them and to take that story and make it part of your platform and there you've done it, when in reality all you're doing is stealing someone else's story and giving yourself credit for it. And that is what this is. It is Mm neocolonialism. It is musical, like, um, what's the (laughs) word I'm looking for here? I I, I, I got on the soapbox and then I fell off. (laughs) Musical imperialism? (laughs) Condescension? It's musical imperialism. Realism. Like, yeah. Thank you. That's exactly what it is. It is condescending. It is Eurocentric bullshit. Like, and, and it was like late 90s, early 2000s, where I'm listening to that song as a young adult. I was like, why would people in Africa care that it's Christmas? Because that has nothing to do with their lives. And I get that it was done with literally the best of intentions. And I do hope that the money that was raised went to help people, although I'm pretty sure I read that they handled it so poorly yep. that they ended up it going to like warlords awesome. instead yeah. of going to the people who needed it is that correct yeah there was a I, I would have to figure out what the publication was but when i was doing my research for this there's actually an article in a reputable newspaper <laughs> about how mismanaged the funds from that were and i will yeah. find it and circulate it so that eric can put it on the website 
Thank you very much. So again, I know that the people behind it were trying to do the the right thing. And I do appreciate that it launched that whole celebrity charity shtick of the 80s and 90s. There is a lot of great that came about it, but I don't think that you can separate this song in 2020, in 2020 specifically. I don't think you can move this song forward without also essentially underwriting the really gross racial overtones of the song. It's not even undertones. It's flat out right in the song. Mm-hmm. And so for that reason, I have to move the pogues ahead, even though I don't like that song. <laughs> Heather, where are you? I, You know, if I were to pick a bracket where I'm like, why couldn't Santa Baby by Madonna have lived here instead Ooh, of sure. and your sisters? This is that moment for me because yeah. I hate both of these songs yeah. and I hate them for different reasons. You know, I, I hate, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> The, the gravelly drunk who's like stumbling, rambling, like, yeah, I went to college and I've lived that. Exactly. I don't need you to sing to me like that because I got a music degree and most of my friends sounded like that every Friday night. <laughs> right. Like, yeah, that does that that does nothing for me. But I'm also with you in the sense of like things that didn't age well mm-hmm. are certainly going to, you know, be band-aid. Yeah. So if you had to pick one to advance, which one is it? I fine, I'll switch and I'll go. I'll, I'll go. Heather, you I'm come go. back to me. You can do it for now, but you come back to me. It just, you know, I have to because I, I hate racism. And I'm, about this, I'm like, oh God, my Christmas is so bad. What are you saying about me? <laughs> By me picking I mean, you can read into that what you would like. <laughs> uh, I don't think, uh, like, I think, I, I know where Curtis is coming from here. Obviously, he's anti against. He's against Obviously, everything yeah. that the song is, is, is kind of representing. But you just hate the Pogue song that much. I, and also... Yeah. Say what you want about ba- about Do You Know It's Christmas. It is a super catchy song. It is. Um, Kate, you legitimately love the pose. I, I'm going to let you hold on to your argument for round two. Yeah, yeah. Because it's, it's moving I'm on to round two. tucking it into my pocket. Kind of kind of reading which way the wind's blowing, but looking forward to <laughs> pull that out. Yeah. Not looking great. <laughs> Not looking great. Three quarters of us got laid to Melikaliki Maka mm-hmm. by KT Tunstall, a seven seed, while Curtis said, take a look at the five and dime by repping It's Beginning to Look a Lot Like Christmas by Michael Buble, a two seed. Buble. Curtis, why Buble? Buble. Well, Buble. so... <laughs> Buble. Buble. Um, Buble. <laughs> Buble in parentheses. Um, KT Tunstall has a lovely voice. I really like her. Um, that cherry tree song, super cute. And I think this Mele Klikimaka is a cute version of that song. But did it really need the kazoo section? No. <laughs> Do you no, I don't. Ask? I'm I don't. Sorry. No. <laughs> um. But I I just don't think you can have a holiday music bracket without Michael Bublé moving forward. Michael Bublé is enormously talented. He is an amazing singer. His voice is like velvet, and I wish I could wrap myself up in it. <laughs> it is a shame that we could only include one song from each artist, because I think he has a lot of beautiful versions of multiple holiday hits that could have landed all across this bracket. There is a reason that this song was voted as the fifth most popular song. It's a two seed. It was the top two seed. And I would like to know what crack you all smoked to put KT Tunstall over Buble. Buble is classic Christmas. I dare you to listen to this song and not immediately imagine yourself in Macy's holding your breath and trying to keep yourself from breaking into a sprint through the perfume area just to get to the sales rack so you can find a sweater that your sister won't wear because she says it makes her look fat. That is Michael Buble, and that is Christmas. Places Curtis Craigmore took me. (laughs) Curtis, that sounds like hell, and why would I want to listen to a song that makes me feel like that? I don't don't want to be there at all. (laughs) Take me out of Macy's. So I will say that... um, I'll, I'll talk about Melly Kalikimaka first because that's actually the job. And then I'll talk about why I didn't pick Buble. Um, I actually, re- I've always liked Melly Kalikimaka. I always associate it with that scene in um, National Lampoon's Hol- Christmas Vacation where yeah. he's envisioning the pool and that song's playing. It's this cheery and different, and it's a different type of, of Christmas song, right? Um, I also 
uh, having been to Hawaii pre-COVID, uh, love it. And I would love to do Christmas there someday. Like that's <laughs> that's new life goal. Um, KT Council's version is really cute. It's it's low key, but it's sweet and groovy. And again, if you put this on at a holiday party, people are going to be moving back and forth. And I don't feel passionately about this one, but I do absolutely like it better than the Michael Buble one because the Buble version is a pale imitation of the Andy Williams version. It's not even yes, not even in the same like zip code nope um i'm not gonna d- deny buble's singing ability musicality and i understand why he's a two cd he is wildly popular all the things the critics said were true but i can't not compare to the original kt tunstall's is a remake too but i don't feel like the original resonates with me the way that the andy williams version of it's a beginning to look a lot like christmas resonates with me and i just don't think that this remake lives up to it uh where are you coming in kate oh definitely melakaliki maka it's just you're right like the gap between the my feelings about the original the andrew sisters one which i really like and this one are much like it, it's not as it's not a chasm <laughs> as it is between the buble and the williams one and also like buble i just he's a smug punchable face and i can't with him <laughs> Thank you. I just can't with him. He thinks mm. he's the shit, and I just could care less. <laughs> he's up there with like Josh Groban for me as another one, where I'm like, would you just shut up? <laughs> <laughs> Although Josh Groban's uh, turn in Crazy Ex Girlfriend really brought him back on the side of me. I'm not going to tell you where he shows up. It's delightful. No spoilers. <laughs> I also think Josh Groban has a level of self-awareness that he's in on the joke. And I don't know if I get that from Buble, which is neither here nor there with this particular argument. Uh, Heather, where are you coming down? (laughs) Um, I'm also solidly in the Melancholic Imaka camp because this song for me is it's like, it's whimsical. It's Christmas when I'm stuck at home with my family and I'm like, oh my God, could somebody please put me on a beach in Hawaii? It's also admittedly the song that made me buy a ukulele one year because I was like, whoa, <laughs> if I played that on the ukulele. And now I'm not a person who usually is like, I'm going to learn a new instrument. But this song, I don't know, it lights something inside of me. And I have to plug again, my girl Ingrid Michelson does a really great rendition of this, uh, both live a cappella as well as on her Christmas album. This song is just. It's magic for me. It is the holidays, and I'm not moving. So after everything I just said, I will I will say this to our listeners, because clearly, as Curtis pointed out, Michael Bublé is a two seed, and for it to go down to a seven seed is kind of scandalous. And I also hear what Curtis is saying about, like, from a modern standards perspective, putting Meli Kaliki Maka over Michael Bublé on a Christmas uh, bracket is bizarre and people are going to lose their shit so i'm on the verge of being swayed oh, even though oh, i oh, frankly to me oh, i like no. let them let but them <laughs> here's the thing here's the thing i come back to this argument that buble's version of this song just isn't very good and it may be a situation where it was the wrong buble song from the album to put on here because like i think he does a version of i'll be home for christmas which is really really good and yes. Yeah. I would not have had any problem advancing that one, but this particular one, I just, I can't, it, it does nothing. It's flat for me. I so, still want to punch him in the face. You can reach us at greatpopculturedebate <laughs> at gmail.com. And please make sure that you do it to the attention of Eric Resniak. <laughs> that is completely fine. And if you come for me, you better be prepared what happens when you find me. So <laughs> Merry Christmas. Uh, we are advancing KT Tunstall. In the 90s Smackdown, we had NSYNC's Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, a one seed, and the original shot fired in the war against Christmas, winning three quarters of the votes over TLC's Sleigh Ride, an eight seed. Kate, you said giddy up, giddy up, giddy up, let's go to t Boz and crew. Why? Oh, God, this song is so charming. This song, it's like, it, it, it takes a classic, makes it itself... Um, it re- like it, I would listen to this a thousand more times than the like, <laughs> yay, like version of Slay right that. No, I'm good. I've heard enough you, of that in my that. lifetime. I would listen to this song many times. It has the same kind of fun banter at the beginning that the Pointer Sisters have about like Christmas. Uh, Left Eyes verses are so charming. And this song, 
feels like 1992. It just feels like 1992. And that is an extremely nostalgic. I was 12. This was a song that was on the soundtrack to Home Alone 2. Like it, it was it really? Yes, it really was. Yes, that's where it came from. Um, I, I just and wait, what's the other song? <laughs> <laughs> oh, the uh, the other song is it, insane. Garbage. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> garbage. Oh, okay. Uh, Heather McLean, with that intro, why don't you take it and break it down for NSYNC? I mean, for those of you who listen to the songs of 1999, I don't really think I'm going to need to make this argument again for you <laughs> because I am a boy band groupie. I'm here. I'm not queer, but I am. <laughs> and I, again, no offense to Sleigh Ride. I don't want it to like get lost in New York or anything like that. Nah, but I see what you did there. Nah. <laughs> uh, but I, I mean, when I think the holidays, all I hear is those sweet, sweet sounds of Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays. You know, like it's just. It's there for me in a way that Sleigh Ride, I'm like, oh, yeah, what is that? Yeah, let me. I had to go back and re-listen to it. That, for me, is always the easy decision maker. And it's in sync. I think that this is mm-hmm. like one of those arguments. It's pure nostalgic because I literally never heard totally. that in sync before song song before. And it did absolutely really? nothing for me. <laughs> are you, are you hide under- oh, wow. It did Every negative to me. I was like, oh. <laughs> and I, in I Kate's think. defense. We grew up in Syracuse, New York, which is where new music comes to die. So <laughs> we were still getting like band-aids. Do you know it's Christmas in 1992? <laughs> TLC didn't get there till two years ago. So every time I go um, home now, still it's like mm, spin doctors on the radio. Not literally, that oh. true. This is true. If you live in Syracuse, t- tell me on Y94 right now, when is the last time they played a spin doctor song? It was in the last 24 yes. hours. I will give you money. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Curtis, Curtis, where are you coming down on this one? This one was tough for me. I I am a big NSYNC fan. That was, oh God, I was so in love with Lance Bass. Oh, same, Curtis. Yeah. <laughs> Joey Fatone for me. You can really? have him. You can yeah. have him. I- I will take him. Did, did I, 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 listen, folks, I can't describe it, but it's the word it is. I saw him in a bar oh. once, Eric. Did I ever tell you that? <laughs> I don't think so, but we need to talk about it after this. <laughs> so, Curtis? That's the extra. Um, we'll, <laughs> exactly. We'll record that and put it out for you all. Um, so th- it was really tough because the Sleigh Ride by TLC, is it's a great song. It's, mm-hmm. it's so mm-hmm. good. And I think if it had just made it to a seven seed, it would have actually probably advanced over some of the other two seeds that we have. Like... I would have put Slay Right up over Mele Kalikimaka or even Dick in a Box, which we'll get to shortly. Mm-hmm. Um, but Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays is like, it is the boy band Christmas song. Well, ho- holiday song. It's like, it includes everything. And it's, uh, it's so catchy. It's so good. And uh, yeah, I'm going to have to rip and sync. Yeah, I'm I'm with Curtis on this one. I would love to advance Slay Ride. I love it. I listen to it every year. It, this is kind of along the lines of Christmas and Hollis, where I'm like, of fucking course, that's up against a Dolly Parton song yeah. in round one. Because that totally should have made it to round three. Same thing with Slay Ride. And so I, t- I just can't put it over in sync. I can't. Uh, to me, that is the 90s holidays that's not Mariah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Is that song. So I'm sorry, Kate. Uh, we will be getting up and going away from TLC. Okay. <laughs> Another tie guys, between Mary uh, Chris- Hear what I have to say about Mariah Carey. <laughs> Oh, 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 it's going to get ugly. Um, Another tie between Merry Christmas Baby by Bruce Springsteen, a four seed, and it's very special Christmas Discmate Winter Wonderland by Rhythmics, a five seed. I'm going to explain why Springsteen sure did treat me nice, while Kate is going out in the cold, cold snow with the Rhythmics. Kate, go first. It's just such a... It's such a Rhythmic song, which, like, Mm. I, I... I mean, I like Bruce Springsteen, but, like, I gravitate more towards the aesthetic ethos of a Eurythmics kind of band. Um, and it, and it just, it has some interesting minor key in the, in the composition, how it's put together. It's Annie Lennox being Annie Lennox. It's part of those very special Christmas albums, which are a huge part of my like nineties and early aughts Christmas, I would say with the Keith Herring drawing on the cover. Um, mm-hmm. It's just, it's very nostalgic for me and it's a very, unique take on um on a song that like i like but don't really love so like it it makes it more lovable to me i just like it better yeah and i will say that i do not have terribly strong feelings does anybody have strong feelings about 
either one of these songs? Not in the slightest. <laughs> no. I mean, I like the Eurythmics, but I, and I don't necessarily really like Bruce Springsteen. I don't think I ever made it through Bruce Springsteen, the, the song, because it starts so slowly. Like in Eurythmics, you jump right in. But with that one, it was like, I made it through the first 10 seconds. It's like, the song still hasn't really started. Fuck this. I'm going with the Eurythmics. And at least it's not and the Santa Claus is coming to town, which I really Oh, hate. God. Terrible. <laughs> like, terrible. terrible. Not that one. God. <laughs> yeah. Terrible. Um, and I will say, Curtis, the that this Springsteen song does never ever get above that tempo. It's stuck <sighs> yeah, in that yeah. in that gear for the whole time. This is going to come down to a strictly personal and nostalgic thing. As a kid, I just did not care for this version of Winter Wonderland, and I love your rhythmics. Ooh. Like I love them. I am a huge Annie Lennox fan, but for whatever reason, this arrangement just doesn't sit right with me, and it never has. It just feels off. And I'm not a huge Winter Wonderland song to, fan to begin with. The one thing I will say for Merry for Christmas Baby, actually on its behalf, is that it is catchy and it's effective. And straight guys can bellow it at a party <laughs> and it's got that going for it. <laughs> Merry Christmas! You know, like, like it, that's, but neither one of these are really doing it for me. If I could take TLC Sleigh Ride and put it in this goddamn yes. one. Why? What's stopping Honestly. you? Honestly. You're, you're the yeah. king of the bracket. I'm the king of the bracket, but I'm not going to, like, I'm not God. So um, <laughs> with that said, I'm going to put it to a vote. Heather, where are you coming down here? I'm, I'm still sticking with Merry Christmas, baby, because my straight white dude dad, like, <laughs> this is the song from my childhood that my dad every Christmas was like, yeah! Merry like, Christmas! Yeah, it, yeah, very much. And Curtis, where are you? You know what? It doesn't even matter. Give the straights what they want. I don't. It, <laughs> it's going up against In Sync next round. So does it really matter? You argued it. The straights what they want. <laughs> <laughs> Give them what they want. All right. So we are advancing uh, Bruce Springsteen to round two, and finally in round one, one last tie between Dick in a Box by Justin Timberlake and Lonely Island, a two seed, and Tom Petty's Christmas All Over Again, a seven seed. Curtis, try not to poke a hole in box. Well, Kate will hopefully avoid breaking my heart by championing Tom Petty. Uh, Curtis, why don't you go first? I cannot believe I am actually going to defend this song being anywhere near this bracket. But here I we are. I can't believe this world that we're living in. But yeah, as you said, here we are. Here we are. Um, this is less of an endorsement of Dick in a Box and more of a rebuke of Tom Petty. <laughs> and like it, Tom Petty in general or this song? I, I'm going to go with this song. Well, no, no. Let's go general. I'm just not a big fan. Like, I love him. It's it's not a strong rebuke by any means. I've just never really liked Tom Petty or his music. And he slides up and down into sure. all his notes like Eric slides into people's grinder DMs. Yeah. And for those of you who don't know how much that is, listen to this song and then you'll figure it out. <laughs> I think where Dick in a Box sets itself apart from other comedy songs like the Hanukkah song is that it's actually not terribly performed. Justin Timberlake is a talented vocalist. And in an interview about the song, Justin said that in order for the song to be successful and to take it to the next level, they needed a song that people actually kind of wanted to sing. And I think they succeeded. It's, it's a catchy song. Um, totally. And what other song in this bracket has to be bleeped out when it's played on television? Does it have to be bleeped out, really? Yeah, they talked. They had to bleep it when it was on SNL. Um, in a box. Yeah. <laughs> Terrible. So Terrible. I appreciate for its irreverence and the comedy that it brings to the holidays. And I just don't care for Tom Petty or his heartbreakers. Have you never heard his American Girl song? The Doll? No, it's called American Girl. It's actually used really effectively in Silence of the Lambs. And in my opinion, has yeah. one of the best um, instrumental bridges yeah. of any song yeah, really ever recorded. It it like is mm -hmm. so good. Anyway, that's uh, off here. Um, so I'm handing it to Kate to talk about. So while I appreciate the Dick in the Bo Dick in a Box is kind of like the <laughs> diehard of Christmas songs. Like, oh, yeah, it is a Christmas song. Like, yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. Um, uh, I chose this Tom Petty song. I like Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. I'm not like a hardcore fan, but I do. There's some songs, American Girl, I really love. Um, Refugee, I really love. Um, I love the stuff he did with the Traveling Wilburys. He was in that, right? Yes, he was. Um, mm -hmm, yeah. And what I like about this song, again, it's part of that very special Christmas uh, uh, albums that raised money for its Special Olympics. Um, I love this song lyrically. Christmas time all over again. It's about 
it's a song about the fact that we do this every year, right? And the way that Christmas songs are about nostalgia, they're about this thing that you have done or holidays that they, they come around every year and you grow with them and you have you know, like such a long history of Christmases specifically in this one, but there's also a lot of like, they're not all completely merry. Holidays are hard. And I think that's why I sometimes (laughs) have a problem. And I am enormously lucky. I'm very close with my family and I'm extremely grateful for that, but they're still like hard. It's travel and stress and, and any song that is too fucking merry. I'm like, what drugs are you on? Like be a human. (laughs) It is not fucking Mary all the time. So, <laughs> so I think we got a window into where you're coming from, right, Carrie, yes. but please go on. <laughs> so, so what I like about the song is that it's kind of gently about that. Has the lyrics, um, you see your relatives, I kind of missed them, but I don't want to kiss them. Like, mm-hmm. it's, I just think it's a really funny, catchy 90s song about the experience of Christmas for a person with modulated emotions who's maybe not on a lot of drugs <laughs> or maybe i mean he's tom petty but like drugs that are not making him manic <laughs> right <and Mary. laughs> right okay uh and heather where are you coming down here oh 100 percent team dick in a box <laughs> 100%. i'm sorry but no other song on this list says to me is as inclusive as this is is the honor true it's very inclusive <laughs> It's for Dick Christmas. It's for Hanukkah. Hanukkah. It's Dick for backstage at the CMAs. Wanda, Dick in a box. Every single holiday, Dick, Dick in, in a, a box. box. <laughs> now, a I hope we even go a step Heather. farther. <laughs> Do you not remember when this song came out and it also became a Halloween costume? Absolutely. Because I remember that. <laughs> I do. Absolutely. And um, I'm not mad about that. So here's the thing. I love this Tom Petty song. I love it. It's one of my all time faves, but it is hard. And like when I saw Dick in the Box on here, I was like, really? A two seed (laughs) Dick in a Box? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But there is something that is unrelenting about it. And I recognize it as walked right into that. Um, (laughs) But um, you wish. I wish exactly <laughs> the unrelenting staying power of Dick in a box, ladies and gentlemen, that's what I want for Christmas. Um, I can't be mad about it. I can't be mad about it. So even if I stay with Tom Petty, it's still going to go. It's, advancing yep. it's a yep. two seed. And so for that reason, I think I am going to, um, um, I'm not even going to call it a protest vote. Cause it's not, I, I've got to stick with my heart, but Dick in a box is continuing to round two. It, it, it's here folks. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> You're dick in a box. Happy here. Kwanzaa, dick in a box. <laughs> Backstage at the CMAs. And there you have it. We have slayed the top 32 to an elf-sized Sweet 16. Who will be the star atop our bracket tree? Make sure to check out part two when Mariah, Wham, Whitney, Dolly, and Pentatonix get unwrapped and join the party, and we see if Christmas magic can bring this tale to a very happy ending. We'll see you soon. 